so what was going on at the time was that James, Paul, and I, we had a very successful foreclosure business where we were flipping probably eight to 12 different properties a month. And some, a couple of them we were keeping for ourselves, but most of them, because there, there were just so many of them out there, we would flip to other investors. We would provide them financing. We would teach them how to fix them up, what color to paint them, what, what kind of repairs to do. And so we would make them money as kind of like a, a finder's fee for flipping. And I was making, I don't know, 150, 160 grand a year. And I was 28, 29 years old. But the way James, Paul, and I had set our, our company up, and how we would buy properties, like Paul had access to the MLS system, which was a multiple listing service. And then I had act, had exclusive access to the HUD property, the HUD foreclosures, which were you know FHA loans that had gone bad. And then I also had probably, I don't know, maybe 30 realtor contract, contacts that I developed over the previous two, three years <clears throat> that were experts. And they were the ones that always had foreclosure properties coming to them. And so the deal that I had with these brokers was that if you, you know, like usually they would get, like the bank would contact them at the time, like First Union, which I don't know who First Union became, but like I had one of them, like First Union had a lot of foreclosures. And so the guy was a, or was a Remax broker that would get all those listings. And so what he did was he would call me up. He'd be like, hey, Corey, I got this new property. I got to do a BPO, which stands for Broker Price, Price Opinion. Opinion. And so that's where he goes out, looks at the property, takes pictures kind of figures out what the actual value is and what he thinks he can sell it for. And then there's usually two to three weeks from the time he submits his BPO to where it actually goes on MLS and then everybody can bid on it. And the deal that I had with them, I was like, hey, if we can get this thing under contract before it actually goes into MLS, then you'll be my buyer's agent and keep 100% of the real estate commission. So and on those properties, it was like a 6% real estate commission like that because if – it didn't, and I was just bidding against everybody else. It was 3% yeah, for sure. them, 3% for us. And so it basically doubled the commission for them. So they loved that. And so he, they would, these different realtors were calling me up. and like, hey, I got this property. You want to go check it out with me? I'm like, sure. So I'd literally go out there you know, three, four weeks before the property ever hit on MLS, and anybody knew about it. And I would do my numbers on it. I would look and figure out what the rehab is going to cost. And then I would give him a price. And then so when he would submit his BPO to the bank – he would also send the offer in and say, hey, this is one of my top investors. And so if you contract with him, he's 100% guaranteed to close because they have their own money. And so that was the bank loved that because they could get that because the banks are in off. the business of making loans. And so they wanted to get it off their books. And because and, and, if you, you put it on the open market, sometimes those deals wouldn't close if somebody outbid us or whatever. And so when they knew they had an investor like us that was reliable, that had the money and the wherewithal to actually close on it no matter what within 30 days – they liked that. It was good for the bank. It was good for us. It was good for the broker because they doubled their money. We, you know, we didn't have to deal with you know much competition, if any at all, on the property, which was nice. And we can usually end up making a little bit more because we could buy a little, a little bit cheaper. Because other people, when you get four or five people bidding on it, other investors, sure. they're going to bid up the price. And so it was great for everybody. And because I had only been in the business for a couple of years at that point, I didn't know, I didn't realize, or <clears throat> didn't it didn't dawn on me. That you know, every three to four years or five years, those realtors would lose those contracts. Like the bank, you know, somebody would come in, they get somebody new, and then that bank might say, oh, "I don't like this broker. I want to, I want to use you know this other broker here to list these properties." And so the guys and girls that I was buying these properties from would they would lose some of those bank contacts. And so over time, it would dwindle. You know, these realtor contacts I had developed. At, at the other company that we had worked at. So I had 30, and then you know after a couple of years or a year and a half, that was like now at those same people, I had about 15. Right. And so since Paul had the exclusive dominion over the MLS properties, those properties I was buying from those banks are now hitting MLS, and then now he was developing relationships with those new realtors. And so my income was starting to decline. And James and Paul, they were they were fucking assholes about it. You know, Paul was like, "Hey, a deal's a deal. That's did what you, we agreed to." Did you one third each? No, that's not how it worked. It was basically when you, when whoever found the property, it, you know, that was you would split the. I think it was the per, the acquisition agent, which would be me or Paul. We get seventy percent. James would get like thirty five percent. I think or sixty five percent. We get James would get like thirty five percent. So it kind of balance out because he's getting properties from Paul and me to sell, but he got, you know, James always got a sales commission on it. 
And James was like, hey, quite frankly, Paul's buying you know more properties than you. And he didn't want to do it. He was just like, even though James was a good friend of mine, it's like, man, money cuts a lot of fucking ties. And yeah. he didn't care. So it was all, to him, it was all business. And Paul was like, hey, I worship the almighty dollar. I was like, this is not fair. He says, yeah, I know it's not fair, but a deal's a deal. This is what we agreed to when we went into business together. I get MLS, you get HUD, and you got your realtor contacts. And so I, because of that, I made a bad deal. I fucked myself. And so I was looking for ways to increase my income. And that's when the, the retail thing came into mind because I was like, we got a mortgage company and a real estate company. We're already getting leads when we're trying to sell our own properties once they're fixed up. So why don't I put these, these bandit signs everywhere and just sell people regular properties? So that was my thinking. And then I can create this whole other division within this company we got and be able to increase my income. And, and that's... That's where the idea came from. And then Andy and I were friends because another friend of mine had introduced us. We'd been hanging out, I don't know, a year, year and a half at that point. And the guys he were working for didn't have many leads and he wasn't making much money. Plus, he was you know, his broke. wife, his wife had kicked him out. He was broke. Yep. I, I let him <laughs> I let him move in with me. I gave him a draw for three or four months until we had that that first closing. And it just kind of it snowballed from there. So I was having to adapt just because. I made a shitty business decision basically and I had two partners that were just – they were fucking assholes about it to be honest with you. And it was – it wasn't the right thing to do but it was like, hey, business is business. Sorry. And the, and the thing that I – that uh, I'll say it. At 28, who has – at 28, hey, who has that, that acumen to go like – you know, it's amazing that, that uh, how young he was and how – how he thought it through because most people at 28 at uh, 28 i don't know what i was doing but i was probably making about five dollars now running a camera but so that that that's quite impressive that you know Corey, you know <clears throat> car a lotus he kind of skated skated by that but who has a lotus at 28 years old i mean it's crazy anyway but so yeah yeah so then then they they came into their own they bought a bigger building in uh on in winter park well you gotta say is the advertising you no. Broker to 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 Corey worked so well over time that the income doubled and tripled. Right. It doubled every year. It doubled so every that year, there were the funds doubled. and the manpower needed because we were sitting in twelve hundred square feet, fourteen hundred, sixteen hundred. We had a house, house. That was converted to an yeah. office. It was like sixteen hundred square feet. What's that called? The shelves we're sitting in. Uh, what is that called? Cubicles. It's cubicles. cubicles. It, and but, hustling till nine, ten o'clock at night, calling people from who called us from the signs. But then you know, and it, it, obviously Corey said, you know, Andy was down and out. But listen, all I remember was Andy, German, cocky, five hundred dollar belt, and he's moving and shaking, and and uh, so you know that's when. And then I think Corey, you, I think you got up to about thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a month in advertising, right? Yeah, when we we. At our height, we were spending about fifty G's a month. Like ten, ten grand was the yellow page ads, but forty was all that, basically going to you and I think another station. That's a lot of money. I mean, and it you know back then twenty been, some years ago. Yeah, yeah. So that was a lot of money then, and it's still a lot of money now. Somebody in it's funny they're going. Is that kid? We kind of come with these new these orders, and my I can remember the, the general manager, general sales manager's name, Andy Offerty. Like, is that kid get, got this money? Are you sure? That, you sure he's going to pay his bill? Always. Well, I remember that all the time. Yeah. And I remember also it's the 23rd of the month and we had 350 or 370 and projected commissions coming because he had a board. So he knew exactly this is coming in to pay such and such bill, your bill, other bill. And we had 60 grand. So we were missing 300,000 seven days prior to it. That happens actually almost every month. So yeah, deals with slides. Fucking Andy, you need to up. fix the shit, you know, because I was in charge of all the Ruben loan shaking. officers. Yeah. But we always came through. Actually, I always came through. You Every did. single credit, month, you did. You got your money. Yeah, yeah. 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 He got your money. I got my money. And they, yeah, but it's always pressure. And they, but again, they they worked hard but played hard. I mean, uh, weeks in uh, the Beverly Hill, Hill, Wilshire, Beverly Hills, Beverly and, Wilshire. Yes. Uh, so yeah, that was a blast hanging out with uh, Hugh Hefner at the Barfly. You remember that? I remember. That was back when it was with the uh, the, the the Barbie twins. The I three. Think it was. Oh, they were Mandy, Sandy, chicks. and Brandy. But we saw also Kiefer Sutherland at the bar. Oh yeah, he was, he was filming he, Twenty Four at that time. His first season of Twenty Four. 
No, not back then. This yes. was like 99? Yes, the 2000, the season came out. Really? Yes, he had his trench coat on. He was hammered, shit-faced. Yeah, I remember but, he was always, he was drinking whiskey. Or yeah, something. yeah, but he was sitting right next to him. He was like, this fucking Yeah, and he was Alec. totally starstruck. I was like, oh, yeah. Then Alec Cool J, I saw in the in in bathroom at, uh, what was it called? Sky Bar? Sky Bar was, was it place, where yeah. we went? Sky Bar. Was I, I know what LL Cool J stands for. Do you guys know? You know. Ladies you're love Cool James, of course. Yeah, ladies love Cool James. And, and then Mickey Rourke pulled up. Remember him? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he pulled up in a small little, was a smart car? And this is 20 years ago. Yeah, but that, was that was a long time ago. That was Those were just was fun times trip. going and hanging out. Yeah. And, you know, because in L.A., you go – because when you're – what we would do, you stay – which is like a little life hack. If you ever go stay at one of those luxury hotels somewhere, whether it's the Beverly Wilshire or something like that, you go to the concierge guy and you go, hey, where are the, where are the cool clubs, the cool bars to go to? And those guys always know people at different places. He was like, I can get you in a Barfly because he'd have people at the door. Barfly, and then yeah. uh, so we went – it was Barfly we went to. It was a cool fucking place. And so I remember it's like you, know, you get a line around the building and then we walk right up. Give him my name. Dude pulls a velvet rope sign. Nice. Okay. <laughs> because the four of us go strolling in there to our, our table, and then there's fucking Hugh Hefner right there right. with uh, Mandy, Sandy, and Brandy, and a bunch of the other Playboy models, and uh, all these fucking famous people there. It was, it was a trip, you know? 29, 30 years old, you, you feel like you're on top of the world. They were. They, they, they were. And let's go back to the, uh, the, uh, the Rolex. So they're always talking about watches and, you know, Andy, this, look at this, bought, I bought, I'm thinking about, and then they would, like, it, Corey mentioned, they, tra- you know, like, if I wanted to buy a car, I'd go down to the local dealership. These motherfuckers were going to, like, <laughs> Palm Beach and go buy one at the low key at the Miami. So I was always impressed. But anyway, so they started talking about uh, buying watches, and I thought, you know what, maybe I should buy a watch. And so somebody, they were talking about, like, arguing the price and i didn't think you could negotiate the price they go yeah tell if it's nine thousand dollars tell me you're gonna give them eight so i i was all i got all uh charged up and i went down to mayor's jeweler at the seminole uh, town center and showed them this watch they showed me the watch i was like oh and i was all nervous and they go they go it's eight thousand dollars or whatever it was and i go i'm not paying that <laughs> and she goes well how much would you pay and i'm thinking they said they negotiate the price and i went i think i'll pay seven thousand dollars and she goes come come let's go in this little room and so i was like oh my god they're so right that you can you can negotiate the price of a watch but anyway so yeah that was her those are good the good times I, yeah times. i remember i think it was that trip we went in, in Beverly everybody Hills. bought a watch we you, went to the bulgari store you bought bulgari ryan and they and take I you downstairs Right. And then uh, I think it was uh, Michael Douglas or one of the Douglases was down. I think it was Michael Douglas was downstairs at the time. He was buying something. And uh, it's like, you know, they take you VIP. And I think I bought, it was like a $5,500 Borgari watch. It was, Big I got some boss. cuff links. It was sweet. You know, it was fun to be able to do things like that and just, yeah. when you're, you know, you're young like that and you're able to, you know, fly around the world and experience hanging out with the rich and shameless people and, because you get those experiences because you have a perception of what that's like and then you do it or you buy an exotic car or whatever and you're like it's cool it's fun for a while but it's like eh. it was a neat experience you know looking back on it now it's like i hadn't thought about this shit in years and, the, and both these guys have have uh the, the confidence of 10 men so it's 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 fascinating to watch them how i love andy but He's cocky. I have a five hundred dollar belt, Mike. You should buy something like this. You know the girls will like it. And you know, and Corey's the same way. I mean, they're so you. I, I don't buy that shit anymore now. I couldn't help but learn from these guys. It's like, wow, these guys. What did you learn? I mean, I, right I now didn't just learn that monetary no, value. No, no but opinions. I know. But the idea about confidence and and it, and I don't want to jump ahead, but in two thousand eight. These guys were down out in Beverly Hills. They just got up, right? You got up. You did you what? The, what was the right word? Did you reinvent yourself? You got up. Well, I got to a place and like it really happened when I got into the platinum partnership with Tony Robbins, and then plus there were so many things converging get- in my life at the time, and so I'm hanging out with with Tony and his wife Sage and all these amazing people. I'm not going to mention any names of who was in there, but it was really cool high level very successful people in there and i just i got to a point in my life i didn't have the same internal enthusiasm for what i was doing i was just tired of butting heads with james and paul 
And Andy and I have been button heads because he's a cocky, arrogant mm-hmm. fucking bastard. And German. He, and he's sharp. And anybody yes. knows Germans, it's like that's why they try to take over the fucking world. They think they're <laughs> they try they think they're the fucking best at everything, you know? And so it was always a struggle. And, and then on top of that, the market was changing because there was so much money being dumped into the real estate and the mortgage business that you know, you remember some of our junior agents are coming to us and they're like, oh, we're 106 percent financing, it's an outdated product. And I mean, the houses that we were selling, like our average sales price was like 189.9. I remember it was a period of about six months where those houses went from like one eighty nine nine to three hundred thousand dollars. I mean, it just appreciated like so fast that the majority of our buyers were now priced out of the market. And so, whereas before you stroll in with a you know a, a two hundred thousand dollar house and you make an offer, you're the only one, and you're getting the buy the seller to pay closing costs, and your buyers only got three or four grand. Now, six eight months a year later, you walk it in there, and they're like. I got 10 offers and these people are putting 20 and 30% down because they had sold their house and because it had appreciated so much, they had all this equity to put down. And here we are competing for the same house. We got three or four grand and we got this 100% finance and then people are like going, eh. So it, and, we're, and they're not asking for any closing costs and we're bidding against this. So you might have to sell three or four houses to get one offer accepted, whereas before we would be the only offer. Yeah. And so you're literally doing four or five times the amount of work for the same amount of pay. And so the younger people that we had working for us, the new, I should say the newer agents, they were really struggling. Oh, we're selling an outdated product and and so I'm button heads with my partners and my heart's not really in anymore. And I'm starting to feel like, you know, it was just weird because when I was younger, I thought I was going to be doing this for the rest of my life, you know, being real estate the rest of my life. But, you know, being hanging around with Tony and going through the platinum partnership experience, I just it was either change the business model or go do something else. So uh, if anybody's interested in, in uh, hearing more of my story, uh, again, the, I, my father committed suicide. My mother left us, me and my brother and my father when we were six. So if anybody's interested in hearing more of my story, I, I've been told it's inspiring. Certainly you can contact me. I believe they're going to put the, my uh, phone number on the, on the beh- below me, my email address. Uh, I'd certainly love to talk to any group or organization. Again, I, th- I, I know that my uh, wheelhouse is people that are below me. Somebody told me one time, they go, Mike, it's hard to, for you to talk to people that make more money than you because they've, they've accepted and, and got what you have and more. But, you know, uh, I work very well. Uh, I think it, my message goes over very well with any blue collar workers or people that are struggling to, to uh, do better. Again, poor crippled kid. And uh, I learned the idea about who you, you are, who you hang around with and, and uh, ask questions of people that have what you don't have. So if anybody would want to contact me, I'm certainly welcome to uh, speak with you about how I might be able to help you. Accept speaking engagements all over the country. Uh, please call me, email me, and we'll discuss rates and, and what you may need from me and what I can deliver. And uh, so I'm looking forward to speaking with you. Let me inter- let me interrupt about the, the, the how I remember the Tony Robbins thing. So uh, so Corey comes. He I think Tony. I don't know how how he met Tony Robbins exactly, but they used to bring the, those motivational speakers into the. Uh, Orlando Arena, and uh, so I saw Tony Robbins banging his chest. So then one time, I don't know if that was the time, but Corey goes, "Hey, I go, what did you do?" And he goes, "Well, I went and saw Corey, uh, uh, Anthony Robbins, and you know he could tell the story better than I." But let me tell you, from my point of view, he goes, "Yeah, they said uh, they took a, like a, a break, and they said come back if you really want to be uh, get some uh, uh, personal coaching or something from uh, Tony Robbins." And he goes, "So I went back there and signed up, and." What was it like one hundred twenty thousand dollars, some crazy figure like that? Well, at the time it was like I think sixty five grand for the membership fee, and then um, I think ten grand of that went to his charity or something like that. But he had like four trips a year that you would go on. They would be like all over the world. These five star exotic things with you and the platinum partners. And back at the time, I think there was. Uh, he said they limited it to 100, but they only had like 50 to 70 people in it now. Now I hear there's like two, 200, 250 platinum partners, and I think the fee's like 100 grand or something. I don't know what it is now. But um, each trip you went on, you had to pay your airfare, you had to pay the hotel. And like the Orient Express one at the time, I was going back 
17, 18 years ago, that was like 15 G's for that trip alone. That doesn't include your airfare or anything, but it didn't include the hotel. But it was it was amazing. You're hanging out in these amazing places around the world. And then, you know, he, two of the trips, Tony and his wife were on, and the other two were usually like his head trainers were running them. And it was just a really great experience. So after a year, going going through that for a year and those four different trips, plus you can go to any of his events, I think I dropped probably 120 grand over so, the course of, you know, 12 months to do that and to meet those people. One of my best friends who you guys have met in the Corey Wayne and Bob podcast, who's still a dear friend. Actually, I had lunch with him yesterday. One of the coolest people I ever met in my life and became a, a dear friend. I, I met him there. So it was a, it was an amazing experience, but it, it it helped me look at the world in a different way. And I, I was just so fucking sick of dealing with James and Paul's bullshit. And then, like I said, Andy and I were butting heads because he's doing well. And, you know, they always got people trying to recruit Andy. Sure. And Andy's like, ah, oh, but... And then we just we you know we were just kind of growing apart, and I got involved with a couple of platinum partners of mine, and that didn't end well. And because we're still trying to figure out how do we adapt this in this changing market, because we were the leads we were getting were no longer working in essence for what we want to do, because our buyers are mostly priced out of the market. So the problem was we were still spending the same money in advertising, but the revenue was just it was continually declining for the same amount of money we were spending. And so I was trying to change the business model. And then after, you know, the, the two guys I got involved with that were platinum partners weren't really who they said they were and didn't really do the things they said they were going to do. I remember I was just sitting in my house one time looking out the lake going, what the fuck am I going to do? You know, I, I had a handful of people working for me at that point. I had a new office and a big part of my capital was going to come from our office building that we had sold. And so like everything just seemed like it was going great. And then literally like a week before we're supposed to close these attorneys were buying our office their deal to sell their office building downtown fell through and so all this capital i was expecting to get from this office building it was gone in a market a real estate market that was starting to go south and i was just sitting there going man what the fuck am i gonna because i didn't have a, i didn't want to do loans or real estate anymore i just was like at that point, I was only doing a deal here and there because these guys were you know, selling all the houses and doing the loans. And I was just kind of running the business. And I didn't have, it wasn't exciting or compelling to me. I really didn't want to do it. And so I remember asking myself the question, well, if I had to start all over, what would I do? I want to do a different business model or I want to do something completely different? And the first thing that popped in my mind was there was a, a guy, I can't remember his name, but he was one of Tony's trainers, and he he had um, I think it was E Trade. He had developed the trading software for these guys, and he was a multi multi millionaire, very successful. And I remember we were at, at Tony's event; it was Wealth Mastery, and so he was showing this trading software, uh, how to trade stocks and stuff that he had developed after he had left E Trade. And I just when I asked myself the question, if I had to start all over and do something else, would I want to stay in real estate, or do I do, do I want to do something else? And the thought of him there, because I remember he had like three people around him watching him. And they were like, wow. They were really, it was neat, the software that he had developed to see trends and when to get in, when to get out and different trades and stuff. And just the mentoring, the coaching aspect popped in my mind. I was like, and then it was like my whole body, I felt hot, felt warm. My back started sweating. It was like, it was like spiritual energy like came over me. And it just felt like the right thing to do, the right path. To go down, and that's when I decided right at that moment, I'm gonna sell my houses. I, I think I have one house left at that time. S get rid of like liquidate everything, the furniture, all that. Get my expenses down to, to as small as possible, and I'm gonna be a, become a life coach and write a book, which eventually became Three <laughs> nice. Percent Man. Nice. And I thought, hey, in a year, be, 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 be. year or two, it's empty. A year or two, I'll be right back where I was, making a couple hundred grand a year. It'll be great. And obviously, if you guys have read Mastering Yourself, you know that, that you know it was like pff, I thought I was gonna continue going. I had a little bit of a dip, and I was just gonna continue going like this. And instead, I just went. Pff. It took about four because, like everything I learned in advertising, you, know, you go if you're selling a three hundred thousand dollar house, you're between the loan and the real estate, you're making twenty twenty two thousand dollars in call commissions. It whack them twice. It's like twenty two thousand dollars in commission. So if you got a you know fifty thousand dollar a month advertising budget, you only have to do a handful of deals to recoup your cost to pay for that. Sure. But when you're selling a thirty dollar book, you got to sell thousands of copies. And so <clears throat> I would advertise on TV. I'd sell a bunch of books, but like 
I'd lose my ass in the advertising. So everything I knew, none of it worked. And the problem was, it's kind of like what Master Yoda says, you you got to unlearn what you have learned. And so because I had all this success, because success is not a great teacher, mm-hmm. failure is. And part of the problem was letting go of everything I knew, everything that worked before, because it's a different industry, different product. And I mean, I was in for a four-year ordeal before I finally figured out the right way to market what I do now. Eventually, like when I started, YouTube didn't even exist. I think YouTube was founded in like 2006. And I didn't even hear about YouTube till I think it was like 2008, 2009. I think it was. It really people started hearing about it and uploading videos. And I didn't start doing videos on YouTube till I think it was 2011 was the first one I had done. And I had bought all my camera equipment like a year before. I had the background and everything, but I was like. What am I going to do? Because before, every time I was on TV, I always came to you. Sure. The station would always film and produce our videos and our infomercials and stuff. <laughs> and so you usually had two or three guys working on it. And every time we did an infomercial, it's twenty or thirty grand. And I think I had four or five hundred grand when I liquidated everything. But you blow that much money on an infomercial, and then you know each time you run a spot, like I think I remember running on I think it was Channel Six. It was like five grand for thirty minutes. Yeah, yeah right. It was after. Uh, so like- when you and then I advertised in Men's Fitness. That was ten G's. That took like you you set the ad up and you pay for it and it comes out in three months, so you're basically sitting with your thumbs up your butt, waiting for the phone to start ringing or, or, or internet traffic and and so like literally four ads over the course of a year. I mean it's a year, so it's like every time I would experiment with something, it's like ninety to one hundred twenty days to figure out if it even worked or not. And yeah, so I'd be all excited about it, and then that thing would come out, and I'd be like, I'd spend ten grand, and I'd get back like five. So everything I did, I was like losing fifty percent, and it was frustrating. I'd never known that kind of failure at that point in my life. It was like nothing fucking worked. That well, talk I did. about talk about how you <clears throat> the the confidence in yourself to go. If somebody said, "Hey, Mike, I'm gonna we could do something, but you're gonna give us sixty five thousand dollars," and and I would be like, "I don't, I, I don't." No. So so that's what I was impressed. You and fucking and Andy, you you must have I think we might have had a conversation like he did what? How, how, where does where does that confidence come from? And you you know, that's like gam uh, that's betting on yourself. And so that's what I've always been impressed with. like you know, like he, all these cameras around here and obviously, you know, he's got a, a a good business now, but that takes a lot of balls to be like, oh fuck it, I'm buying a fifty thousand dollar this or that. I mean, that's what I've always been impressed with you because Shit, you don't give a fuck, do you? You, that's amazing. Because most people are like, I don't know, maybe, I don't know if I should or not. I gotta think about this. You just went back there and signed for with Anthony Robbins, and obviously it worked out, and you, you learned from it. But that's <clears throat> a ballsy move, young man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like you don't you don't know what you don't know at that point. And I was just, you figure it out. What's the other alternative? Go back and. And do something else. Go back in the. I even considered one time going back in the construction industry, which was like the worst thing. I because I, I was done with that business. I didn't want to do that shit anymore. And then to have all that money and all that success, and then 2009 move back in with my dad. I think I had eight payments left on my BMW, the X5. That I love that car, and. I'm thinking, man, I'm gonna my car's gonna get fucking repoed. And then my dad, he actually paid my last few payments, advanced me the money. I, I paid him all that money back years later, but that's that's humiliating. It's like you know, being 39, 40 years old and having all this success. I I mean, I, I remember going out with my my uh, I'm, I don't want to say her name on camera. Remember my my girlfriend, the redhead one, the daughter. Mm-hmm. We were out in a club in downtown Orlando, and she and I were dancing, and we were all over each other. And and she was just standing there, and I was just thinking, everybody's looking at us. It's like they're, I, mean, I was like, they're checking out my girl because she was hot. And she says, they're not staring at me; they're staring at you. You know, it's because they recognize me You're from the, the television commercials. And I was like, I was just laughing. I thought it was funny. I was like, I mean, it's an advertisement for a real estate mortgage company. I didn't think anything of that. That stuff didn't bother me, you know. But to go from that. Hanging out in places where fucking Hugh Hefner is in the table next to you with his, Three his girls. you know, Manny, Sandy, and Brandy, and all these other famous actors, and hanging out with these powerful people, and now here I am at 39 years old. I'm sleeping on my fucking dad's couch. I got like four or five grand in the bank. I got you know a couple thousand dollars, maybe a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars, two thousand a month coming in. And I was like, I feel like a failure at that point because it's like 
it was like just constant four or five years of just backsliding and just things not working when I had only known success at that point. It's humbling. You know, it's like one of the things that Jocko Willing says, be humble or you will be humble. And I got a big serving of humble pie, but I was like, what's the option? As a man, you're, you give up on your dreams. As a man, you give up on your dreams, you're fucking dead. What's the point of living at that point? Right. And so I was like, I had to figure it out. Eventually I figured it out and you and everybody else was laughing and snickering. Hey, Corey, you lost everything. He thought he was the shit. He ain't nothing now. He's sleeping at his dad's couch. And I was like, someday, fuckers, y'all be, y'all be laughing. I'll, I'll, I'll get back to, I'll get back to where I was. But I had, I just, in, in my mind, I was always like, ah, six months, I'll, I'll be off my dad's couch. I'll be back to where I was. I'll figure it out. You know, it's just a matter of trial and error. And it's like when everything gets stripped from you, it's kind of, you know, like what I was talking about earlier, what Master Yoda said, you must unlearn what you have learned. That's kind of what I had to do. I had to let go of everything. I had to let go of my pride, my ego, everything I thought I knew about advertising and business. And when you don't have a lot of money coming in and you're waiting tables, which was like the one thing I said I would never fucking do when I left my Chuck's Steakhouse job in like 92, 93, was 10 bar or wait tables. And here I was, like middle of summer, it's slow, Delray Beach. I'd work like eight, ten hours, and I'd go home with like 80 bucks. And, you know, it's like, and I didn't even want to drive my car anywhere because if something broke down that damn BMW, well, it's, it's three grand. It's yeah, it fucking three grand, two, three grand, no matter what. And that was all the money I had in my bank. And I'm thinking, man, I'm like one, I remember when the alternator went bad, it, you know, it seized up. I had to get towed. Yeah. And then that was like two or three grand to get that fucking fixed at yeah. the time. Wiped out my the money that I had in the bank. And you know, you're waiting tables. And it's like, so I would go, like do a, a Google paper click campaign. And I would I would work a shift, make 80 bucks, maybe 100 bucks on a good night because the summer was slow. Like during the season, you make maybe 200 a night or whatever for that particular shift. And then so when it's your money and you worked and your legs are sore and you're tired, I'm working with all these cute girls that are like 21, 22, and I'm this 39-year-old dude. My fucking legs are hurting and I'm sore running around. You know, you're running around like a maniac right. serving plates and dinners and stuff like that. And I remember just there was this little sink in the, the back by the kitchen where you would wash your hands. And I remember I'd go back there and I'd wash my hands and I would look up. And it was like above where it was like the compressors for the, the beer and the soda chase lines and stuff. I was just thinking, how the fuck am I going to get out of this? This is the worst thing ever. I'm a fucking failure. I feel like a fucking loser at that point. And I was like, I feel like I knew nothing at that point in my life. And I was like, I got to figure out a way. And so when you don't have a lot of money to spend, you become very frugal. You're forced to become very frugal because you can't spend what you don't have. And I, I couldn't borrow any money or anything at that point because I had debts and things that had gone bad and I, I didn't, wasn't able to pay back company lines of credit and, and other things. I had a, my boat had gotten fucking repossessed because it had gotten destroyed. Somebody had broken in where it was stored and just destroyed it, trying to steal the speakers and the sound system. And and I was like, I was like, it literally hit rock bottom. And it's like when you, you hit rock bottom, that's when you're kind of forced to go in a totally new direction. Yeah, but and some people... Well, let me finish. And so, so, like I said, it, with trial and error, I started looking around. I remember... <laughs> I remember um, one of the one of the guys I had studied like internet marketing from. He was like, make make an email list, an email newsletter, and I was like, I didn't like writing. You know, even though I'm a writer, that's what I do for a living. I fucking hate writing, and people love my quotes, like my my new book, the quotes, ruminations, and contemplations. Is writing these quotes? I mean, it's excruciating for me to come up with these at times because I don't feel very inspired. I don't. I'm not a writer. I don't want to write, but whatever reason people like the words that I put together. It's just one of the gifts I have from studying self-help quotes and mindset my whole entire life. And so writing email newsletters, I started doing that and sending a couple of those out a week. And I started selling books and started selling CDs. And I was like, wow, I started getting more coaching from that. And then enough of its money started coming in from that. I was like, I don't have to work at this sports bar anymore. And I remember my dad, I took my dad out to dinner and we celebrated that. I was like, finally, I figured out my fucking business model. It was like four fucking years, hundreds of thousands of dollars, 
that just being humiliated and hearing through the grapevine now everybody's laughing at me and snickering and sneering why well, he's a fucking loser he deserves it fucking the arrogant prick or you know whatever it was sure. and uh and then once i i made it back it was like oh i knew he turned around <laughs> i knew he figured out oh yeah i total confidence right. in you it was like you fucking assholes and it's like you find out when you go through shit like that who's really on your team who your real real friends are and so i stuck with it and it was just trial and error 